For decades in multiple sclerosis, we have searched for a biomarker other than spinal fluid to help us with the diagnosis of MS and with the prognosis and management of multiple sclerosis. Today, I have Dr. Mara Casey from Cedar sinai She's a neurologist and multiple sclerosis specialist and researcher. She's also on Instagram and YouTube. Check out the social media links in the notes below. Thank you for taking the time to do the interview. Thank you for having me. So there's been a lot of research in the last several years on neurofilament light chain as a possible biomarker we could use in MS clinically. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So uh, neurofilaments are part of the axon structural protein. So the axon is the nerve that basically carries a signal from the brain to wherever else it's going. And it's one of the main targets in MS. So the, the immune system kind of attacks the insulation around the axon. And when it does, when it attacks that insulation, the myelin, it can go a level deeper and attack the axon itself. And so what happens is that the structural proteins that make up the axon are released into the spinal fluid, the brain, the fluid bathing it. And so we've known this for a long time. That's not news. What is now new is that we have the sensitive technology to pick up the small amounts of this protein that make it from the spinal fluid into the blood. So we're now able to measure it in reliable levels all in the, uh, out in the blood, which means we can avoid doing a lumbar puncture to get this spinal fluid sample and which made it a much more pragmatic test. So obviously we wouldn't want to be doing spinal taps every three months, but you could have blood tests every three months. So, you know, what is this used for? Serum, neurofilament, light chain, what could we use it for? For diagnosis, for management? So it is a level that goes up the neurofilament level with anything that's damaging the brain pretty much. So it goes up with normal aging, it goes up with traumatic brain injury, it goes up with a lot of neurodegenerative conditions. So I don't think we can really use it to diagnose MS because it will just really help us to distinguish a normal brain from a brain with something going on, right? Not MS from its mimics, which is really what we need from a diagnostic tool. But it is hopefully going to be a very powerful tool to monitor MS once it is diagnosed and to make sure that people are on the proper treatment, maybe even to try to predict relapses as they're starting. Because what we see with the neurofilament is that the level will be at a certain place because there's ongoing damage in the brain. And if you treat that person, that level goes down because now you've, you've decreased the amount of damage in the brain. And with people who are on more powerful disease modifying therapies, that level actually drops lower than people who are on some platform therapies like injectables, for example. So it's very exciting as a potential easy to measure tool that can help us to determine whether somebody's on sufficient or appropriate disease modifying therapy. Yeah. And so, you know, what is like the timing between the change and the worsening of clinical symptoms? Do we see it at like the same time someone is having a relapse or can we see it be elevated even when someone is feeling well, but maybe they're having some subclinical disease activity? There's not been a lot of studies on using it as a pre-relapse tool, so I don't know about the time frame there, but uh, I do think, as, as you mentioned, that we can use it to, to measure disease activity that's going on, even though the person feels perfectly fine. This is part of what we use MRIs for now, right? It's sub monitoring for subclinical activity for new lesions. And the neurofilament is even easier than an MRI and can do similar things and that it can pick up subtle damage to the brain that tells us that the MS is not well controlled, even if someone is feeling okay. You know, so there's been this trend in MS for us to be more aggressive, to give people stronger disease modifying therapies, earlier on because the name of the game is preventing irreversible neurological disability. And a lot of people want to treat to target NEDA, which is no evidence of disease activity. And currently we're using, you know, clinical relapses, worsening of disability, new lesions on MRI, and potentially serum neurofilament could be part of this no evidence disease activity right now. Do you think that's something we could use it for going forward? I think so. And we'd have to talk about cutoffs of what, what counts and how sensitive we want our cutoffs to be at that point, um, because it is a pretty sensitive test. But it, it certainly fills the disease activity box, right? If you have neurofilament that's skyrocketing in someone who's been low levels for a while, in my mind, that is new disease activity, unless they have something else going on, for example, like a, trauma, a traumatic brain injury that you know is happening. So yeah, I do think this would be a very appropriate tool to use for Anita. Uh, once we have standardized levels. 
So do you think, I know this isn't readily commercially available for most people right now, but do you think this is something that we could use right away or do we need further research on it? You hit it on the head, but that's exactly the reason we can't use it right now is that it's expensive and the, the machinery that's used is not widely available. So right now it's available through a machine made by Quanterix, which is not widely available. It's usually only in research institutions. I think we have one at Cedars, um, but that's it. And I, I think that uh, the... Uh, company Siemens, who makes a lot of MRI machines too, is working on developing a machine themselves that can measure it. And I think they're, they're a much larger company. So maybe that will help with the commercialization and the widespread availability of this test. But for now, I think that is the biggest thing that's limiting it because we do have pretty good data um, from studies. And you, you may ask how we already have so much, so much data, but it's because people were collecting blood and banking blood from a lot of the clinical trials for the MS medications that were done over the years. And they were just able to kind of test them on mass like that once the technology developed for this blood test. So I think the data is there. It's more the, um, the practical application and just being able to run these blood samples uh, widely. Yeah. I mean, I've seen one thing as a potential use is in studies in progressive MS, where it may be very, very difficult to detect a lot of mm -hmm. clinical change over short periods of time. And there aren't necessarily a lot of new MRI lesions in older people with progressive MS. It could be like a phase one or phase two trial marker to see if a drug might work. And then that drug could be then taken to actually be studied in a larger population to look for clinical outcomes. Do you have any other thoughts on serum neurofilament light chain in general, or what we can hope for the future? I would keep my eye on it. I, I do think that this is going to be part of our practice pretty soon, uh, but more for, as you mentioned, a marker of disease progression or changes in that individual and less for use in the diagnostic process since it is elevated with a lot of things that aren't related to MS at all. Well, thank you for taking the time to do the interview. Again, definitely check out Dr. Casey's YouTube channel in the link below. And if you have any questions, please post in the comments below.